So he got up there in a room about the size of folks, and I was my guy from Atlanta, and he says the two worst places in America for sex trafficking are Houston, Texas, and Atlanta, Georgia. And here I was in this room, all eyes were on me. What are you doing about that trade in your, your community? I grew up here in Atlanta and had no idea that this was happening in my own backyard. So I came back to Atlanta in 2009 and started asking questions of some elected officials, business leaders, and every single time I started asking questions, I would get my hand slapped. Don't talk about Trey. Don't talk about Trey. That actually pushed me more to start talking about it, for people to tell me not to talk about it. And then I realized through the process there were some great organizations and people, that some of those are on the panel, that were doing incredible work here in Atlanta to combat a human rights issue here in Atlanta, sex trafficking. So I want to give you the background of one reason why we selected that here in Atlanta chapter to discuss. Resources to bear to uh, deal with those businesses, uh, to highlight the problem and, uh, and end it. Uh, and so I think we have to take, and my posture is I take a very um, aggressive stance with that. I meet with uh, the, the uh, policing powers, I meet with the health officials uh, in the county health department and see what uh, levers in government we can use to make sure we're keeping a keen eye, a close eye on what's going on and using those levers to stop these conduits uh, for victimization. Um, so that's just, you know, and it's going on all over uh, and, and the technology allows it to also go on in places where you don't see it, where it's hidden, where in affluent communities technology is used to um, coerce uh, young girls um, into um, victimization and, uh, and it's right under uh, their own roofs and their, their parents don't realize it. So um, there's, there's a lot of things that um, we have to educate families on and communities on in, in DeKalb County, uh, in my district, because it's one, it, you know, Trey, when Trey said, I don't know where he went, but when he talked about, um, people said, don't talk about this. I understand that because there are businesses that they make a living uh, uh, you know, they want to look the other way, so you've got that pressure, and then you've got uh, folks that just don't even realize that this is going on in their own community. They don't, they don't believe it is. They don't see it. It's because uh, technology has allowed it to be so subterranean uh, in, in many cases. So these are some of the challenges and some of the things I'm working on in DeKalb, um, and some of these great panelists, I look forward to continuing to work with them, working with Chief King, I know, uh, already. Um, to, to fight this terrible problem. Thank you. And I'm, for each of you, I've been given a question and a follow-up question. So, if I, okay, we'll go ahead and go through that. I, I know when I moved back to I moved back to Georgia in 2004. I was shocked as Trey was. Apparently, in 2000, and you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I'm right about this. It was a $50 fine and a misdemeanor uh, to be trafficking children or involved in these issues. It took to 2011 to change the laws. Now it's up to $150,000 fine, I believe, and up to life in prison. There are a lot of people who know a lot more about this on this panel than I do. So we've changed, you know, but that took 11 years to, to change those laws. We have a huge adult entertainment industry in Atlanta. It's a big part of our convention business, I'm sure, uh, or in the metro area. Um, are there any, um, and, and I think, to your point, big data with facial recognition for both victims and perpetrators we have the largest health care IT um, ecosystem in the country in Atlanta, which I hope we can take advantage of big data and other things. But are there policy change? You know, that was a big policy change that made a huge difference. And there may not be, but are there other areas of policy that you can recommend in DeKalb County or otherwise from a state level that might help us be more effective in addressing this issue? Well, I, th I think there are. Um, you know, recently um, I met with the um, health department in DeKalb. And I think that there are things we can do there to give them some more robust abilities to um, go into places and eventually shut them down. I think we need to put more tools in the toolkit for our law enforcement um, so that when we see and suspect these things, we can have the ability to go in more assertively, uh, more preemptively. Uh, and I think the health department is a good uh, place to start there. So I was uh, speaking um, uh, last week with them about, you know, what they can and can't do and where the law does, um, you know, not permit them to do certain things. And so I think more robust um, laws for our health department to allow them to uh, 
and, and quite frankly, funding too. I mean, even as we do that, even as we give more powers to health departments, uh, police, and so on, we've got to follow that up. They've got to have the people to do it. And so that's a problem. I know that um, the health department doesn't have the number of inspectors they need. Uh, so uh, we've got to put um, put more money behind that type of enforcement and give them more robust abilities to to go in um, these hotels and uh, and 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 be able to shut them down. I don't think they feel they have the ability to shut them down. And really, uh, you know, so, and, and when we can do that, when we can shut down a, a, an extended stay motel situation, essentially, that uh, where we know victims are being housed uh, and it's an unsafe situation, um, when we can give them that ability rather quickly, you know, then, then the business community is going to do you have to deal with that? And, uh, you know, to Trey's point, people again said, stop talking about this. We can't stop talking about this. We've got to bring this to light. We've got to make this an issue um, that um, that everybody knows. And it, it, someone, uh, uh, Greg Chevalier and I were speaking, and he said to me, um, you know, back when um, the drunk, um, Mothers Against Drunk Driving started, right. he right. said, you know, they didn't think that they were gonna stop drunk driving. They didn't, but it, it you know, but it became such a big deal. They, they were amazed at how they were able to get that message out and it totally transformed the expectations of behavior and what was acceptable, what was you know, just you know, flat out accepted in society. And, that, and that's the same mission I think before us. So in addition to the robust powers I think we need to give um, officials like at the health department that would be more helpful. We've got to keep pushing this issue onto the front pages. We have to talk about it. We can't look the other way. We have to talk about it in our churches, with our county commissions, with our police department, our schools, everywhere. We've got this, so I think that that's our challenge. What MAD did for um, the drunk driving um, issue, we have to do for human trafficking. I think that's a brilliant point. And, uh, um, Chief uh, King, uh, would you? I'd love to get your uh, reaction um, from a law enforcement standpoint. I've, Linda Dean and I, who's also on the panel, obviously had an opportunity to go with Director Keenan and meet with the White House on this issue. And he's he is a real national leader, I think, in this area. And one of the things we talked about was at the time the 277 law enforcement agencies in Georgia, and how can we coordinate our efforts more effectively? You know, by community, and it also goes to the point you may. I used to chair the Department of Community Health Board. Public health is fun out of that. We've got local health, we've got state, we've got federal. How can these different agencies collaborate more effectively, and what are you doing and seeing at the local level to address the issue? The first thing I think we have to realize is that we have a crisis. We have a crisis in our hand, and nobody, again, nobody wanted, to, nobody has ever wanted to talk about this. Um, I came from the no, I mean, I went and joined law enforcement back in, in, in the 80s. I mean, Miami Vice. I wanted to be that guy in the cotton suit <laughs> driving a Ferrari. And so we focused on drug, you know, drugs, uh, and going after drugs. And we saw what crack cocaine did to, to the streets of our, our, our communities. And now we have this other evil. And I think that evil has always been there, but we just didn't pay attention to it. Um, and so we're, you know, first of all, I mean, I, I heard a local uh, prosecutor recently was, was testifying at the legislature. Well, we don't, we, because we don't have statistics, we don't know how bad of a problem we have. And, and, and anybody that walks the streets of our community, and I, my community is mostly an international community, Buford Highway, 285, which is the traditional international corridor of, of the Metro Atlanta area, has been, uh, has been seeing these cases. The challenge is, is who, who reports this crime? To, to, to create a statistic, there has to be an arrest, there has to be a victim, and that's how traditional law enforcement has always looked at this problem, okay? So they go and set up a, an undercover operation, they arrest a couple of girls, and everybody gives each other high fives and goes to the house. But that is just the beginning of trying, to, you have to look at this as an organization. This is the most complex, and I've, and I've participated in investigations dealing with, with uh, very, very elaborate organizations that deal with narcotics over my career. I was born and raised in Mexico. Spanish is my first language. So it's easy for me to, to go into my, my niche. 
But then we start looking at the complexity of some of these organizations and how they move girls uh, for in, from all over the world. And not in, in on Beaver Harbor, we deal with you know Korean students coming here on student visas who overstay, who then go into the karaoke bars or the massage parlors, or young Colombian or Nicaraguan or Salvadorian girls that come through Mexico and come in and are moved from town to town through the East Coast. These are very highly organized, or, you know, you know, organ criminal enterprises. They're very hard and difficult. But if you don't, you know, but first you have to show, you know, Americans. We like numbers. We like to be able to say how bad, you know, how many drugs we seized. With this problem, the arrest of a bunch of girls working at an extended stay hotel or working at a massage parlor is just the beginning. There, you know, in convincing the girls that they're victims. That's the first step is that they are victims of a criminal enterprise and getting them to assist us in an environment is very difficult. So uh, in, when people say, oh, that's a victimless crime, I, I refuse to accept that. And you have to, you know, it, it touches almost every fabric of, of our society. From the guys, you know, standing at the Home Depot, you know, day laborers or standing in the corner or working, looking for work, the cantinas on, on Beaver Highway where the girls charge money to dance with, with with the guys, or the, you know the you know Asian uh, massage parlors or nightclubs, all this is, is you know a, a an incredibly complex problem. And you know I work very closely with Director Keen, and I just came from uh, we went to uh, the country of Georgia uh, together uh, last week, and they're dealing with the whole migration and, and, and the human trafficking factors that they're dealing with. So. Um, the hardest thing we have to convince our community is that we have a, an incredibly complex problem, and it, it is not just a law enforcement issue. I mean, it is easy to just say, hey, cops, go handle it. You know, it has to be the health department, the fire inspectors, are incredible tools for being able to go and look at places that are unsafe. Mm -hmm. uh, working with our hotel businesses and, and the hotel security because. Our biggest, you know, the challenge right now is that all this is moved off. We traditionally thought of prostitution as the girl standing on the side, you know, look at TV. You know, the girl standing on the, on the, on the corner of P Street and say, $50 to make you holler. You know, I mean, you know, those days are long gone. It is now gone internet where they're looking, it's like Uber, you know, Uber. They're looking at their big, they're, they're picking their girls and the, the customers have, you know, a rating. It is incredibly complex. And it takes it takes a lot of people rolling their sleeves up and saying, "Hey, we're going to deal with this." And this has to be a relentless struggle. Is there anything that you can advise us as citizens uh, in in addressing operators or victims that you, you think we can be more effective in the schools and the community at large, etc.? The, the challenge here is, you know, nobody can can help us better than the community by being able to tell, look, it's okay to talk about this. And, and if you're a, if a victim of a, of, a, of a young girl or a young child comes to you and says, hey, I, this is happening to me, is okay, let me find you somebody in law enforcement that will understand the complexity of this crime and it will help you. You don't have to be afraid. They're not gonna, it's not about deportation. We have means to deal with. We work a great relationship with, with uh, Homeland Security and being able to, once we identify a victim, give them temporary visas so they can help not only prosecute these cases, but at least give them a refuge. Fear is the biggest weapon that these organizations have. And they use fear of deportation, incarceration, as a way to keep the girls, you know, all the young children, you know, subject. I've never heard that what you just said about temporary visa. <coughs> Thank you for sharing that. Um, uh, my next question is for Dennis Miller. Um, at the collegiate level, um, how are you teaching or providing opportunities for our future leaders to be exposed to um, a, and, and address human rights issues like sex trafficking? Uh, first of all, most of my work um, in this area is in Eastern Europe. Uh, I just got back from Slovakia. I uh, was there for about 15 days. Um, I think this is the 46th or 7th time I've been just as long here. But I've worked in about nine countries in the region, and I learned something there that was very important. Um, a lot of times we think the whole idea of awareness 
is not as important as it really is. Uh, I know we have a lot of students at Bryan College where I work. I, I run the Center for International Development. A lot of them would like to be out arresting traffickers, uh, putting them in jail, rescuing girls who've been trafficked. All of that is good and needs to be done, but one of the things I've learned uh, since 1991, working in that part of the world, is awareness is the most important issue. In fact, um, I was involved in setting up four two-day seminars uh, for the Georgia Department of Education. In fact, I met you through um, Joel Thornton a couple years back uh, in the process of doing the seminars, and I was involved a little bit too, well, quite a bit in setting up the Carter Center program in 2013. And during those seminars, I brought people in from various backgrounds, like State Department, FBI, Scotland Yard, and one of the things I remember more than any of the presenters that we brought in is I had two Scotland Yard human trafficking team founders at uh, one of the seminars at the Capitol. And they said that, um, and I'll tell you how this ties in with students, they said that in Lithuania, uh, well in London, they had more girls trafficked from Lithuania than any other country. And the government of Lithuania decided at one point to put billboards, you know it's a small country, but they put billboards on every major highway in Lithuania warning girls about trafficking. And within a couple of years, they said we could hardly find a girl in London from Lithuania. So that story is something I've told to students at our college over and over, because one of the things that one of the two, in fact, Steve uh, Wilkinson, who formed the Scotland Yard Anti-Human Trafficking Team, one of the stories, um, one of the things he said that I've never forgotten is that not, if you look at 27 million people, and of course that's just an estimate, we don't know the real number, it's like saying how many uh, people are on drugs in Atlanta, who knows, we can only do an estimate. But let's say 27 million is pretty accurate. He said when you look at that total number of uh, people trafficked around the world, not many victims are ever rescued, and not many traffickers are ever arrested, and very few are prosecuted. And he said, at least in the UK, not many of them get long sentences. They're pretty moderate sentences when you think of the crimes they've committed. So he said the best weapon, since not many people are rescued, not many uh, perpetrators are either arrested or prosecuted or receive long jail sentences. So the best weapon, he said, really is awareness. So what we try to do at Bryan College is, uh, first of all, we have a very active STOP chapter. I believe the first stop chapter, students stopping the trafficking of persons, was started at Georgetown. I think Bard College in New York was second, and I think we were the third. Well, because our students were so enthusiastic about awareness and about trying to do something during their collegiate career, we actually went from a stop chapter that we started about 10 years ago to offering a major uh, in human trafficking through our politics and government division. And we also have a minor that we offer the students. And we try to involve students in any kind of activities that we're involved in, especially um, one of the things I'm trying to promote is I'll have 15 students in various countries, uh, mostly in Central Eastern Europe this summer. Uh, and I involve them in a lot of social projects. Uh, we do more than just trafficking. We're very involved in a related issue of abuse of women and children. Because in most of the former Soviet countries, abuse of women and children is an even bigger issue than trafficking. But there's, of course, a very close tie-in between those. Uh, it's, it's very interesting, your comments about awareness. Uh, Lee Shaw, and I'm sure a lot of the people from Georgia in the room, anyway, are familiar with Shaw Industries in North Georgia, which we're really a carpet capital. Um, he was approached by Michael Thurman when he was our attorney general, and he said, we've got a crisis with meth. 50% of, over 50% of our emergency room visits over 50% of our um, incarcerations, north of 70% of our foster care children in North Georgia, it is meth related. Lee raised 18 million, spent half of his time for six years, and helped meth use be reduced by 85% in the state of Georgia after a six to seven year effort. But it was because they were, they were taught to over 100,000 children in schools. They did over 85,000 radio spots. They did over 67,000 television spots. They did social media blitzes and campaigns, and they hit them hard. And you guys have probably seen some of the, 
they're really graphic. I mean, it scares the daylights out of you. Here's your brain. Here's your brain on meth. You know, it, um, and it, perhaps if we had an approach from that, and I know that Street Grace, I know Mary Prince is going to speak in a moment, as a module, four of eight they've implemented, I think, in all 180 school districts to help administrators, staff, and faculty recognize the signs of abuse. Um, and we, there is another human rights issue that's underway with the university system that may be effective. Um, so that, that is incredibly helpful to talk about what Lithuania has done. Thank you. What do you think that People to People International can do? Um, and should they, do you believe they should take a, a lead internationally um, in looking at different groups and bringing them together to combat uh, trafficking? Do you, what role do you think, what leadership role do you think this organization can play international, nationally and internationally in helping to address the problem? It's a very good question. I believe um, in American exceptionalism, but I also believe in exceptionalism globally. I think there's exceptional people in every country. But the main thing that I've run into, I was, uh, I was in Bratislava uh, in April, and I went to a conference sponsored by the U.S. Embassy and by the Soros Foundation. I think most of you are familiar with George Soros. It was uh, invitation only, uh, not open to the public. We had about 100 people there. And it was basically the U.S. Embassy and American officials trying to encourage uh, Slovak prosecutors, judges, the head of the police for the entire nation, officials um, you know, who were in positions to do things, to take action against organized crime. In fact, the name of the conference, or it was a forum, was How to Catch Big Fish, Organized Crime in Slovakia. We spent more than two hours uh, with the American side pushing really hard and with the Slovak side resisting very hard. There's not a will to fight even um, general organized crime. Uh, and Slovakia, you have to remember, is a member of NATO. They're a European Union country. So you can imagine if you get further east into Belarus, Moldova, Ukraine, Romania. Of course, Romania is uh, European Union also. But even though they're a part of the EU, they get a lot of money from Brussels for all kinds of things, they weren't willing to even address the issue of organized crime at all. And organized crime is the driving force behind human trafficking in that part of the world. So part of what has to be done, I think, is guidance, pressure, networking from the United States and from the West in particular, and from individuals of conscience and organizations and in countries outside the West. But uh, there's just not a will in that part of the world to, uh, to deal with this. And I think we have to help create a will, maybe through pressure, through incentives, <coughs> through a lot of concerted action. I wonder if we could use the UDHR, which you know all the 166 signatories in 48, only Saudi Arabia did not sign it. A lot of these are new countries since then. But I, I wonder if people, the people international could take a role in using UDHR as a fundamental human right, et cetera. But you're right. like. In this country, obviously, we had that issue with organized crime for years and years until we had RICO and other statutes where you could come after them as an organization effectively. I think that's a great point. Yeah, and I think people to people could play an important role, not just in terms of interacting mm -hmm. uh, with governments and NGOs, but mainly in a almost a monitoring type role. Because unless somebody's monitor, um, monitoring the behavior, uh, of the government toward these kinds of issues, it's probably not going to happen. Maybe if there were some sort of rating, et cetera, human rights, where you embarrassed, you know, you just you point out the who's who's have the, has the biggest problem in their countries, et cetera. Yeah, the State Department actually does a rating. You know, they publish a report on human trafficking each year, but there needs to be people on the ground uh, from the outside mm -hmm. interacting with people on the inside, pretty much on a day-to-day -day basis. But it's a really great question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Linda, Linda Dean, um, if I can find, um, how did you get involved with this issue um, and how did you get the local People to People International group involved with the issue and why are you passionate about this issue? Thank you, Ross. Um, as I was driving in here today, uh, my daughter called me. She works for social services in Alabama and just right outside the hotel and she said, Mom, she said, um, we're seeing so many cases right now of children that are being abused. And she said, what is so sad here in the United States and even in Alabama that 
parents are selling their children just to survive and just, you know, into human trafficking and for sex and this, that, and the other. And I said, I know, Cammy. I said, it's so heartbreaking and this elephant is so big, I don't know exactly how to tackle all of it, but I will say this, it takes um, cooperation and working together. It's not one person doing this, trying to do this alone and on an island by herself. And um, so it takes all of us working. But how I got involved in human trafficking, it's something that's very, um, very close to my heart. And um, I'll just share a story with you. There was a little girl that was three years old and when she was three years old, and this happens a lot in homes, and she was sexually molested by her grandfather. And so as time went on, she was, um, there was more molestation going on and um, things going on in this child's life. And so it set her up and she was always afraid to talk about anything that could ever happen to her as far as, um, you know, if, if anybody in the family <coughs> found out about this, you know, she was threatened that she couldn't talk about it. And like um, John was saying a few minutes ago, children need to feel safe. They need to know that they can talk about these issues and say, tell what's going on in the homes that's happening. And um, so what it did is set this child up to make all the wrong decisions in their lives. And they uh, went from one relationship to another relationship and the abuse kept going on and on. And so when a child is set up like that and they're afraid, they feel isolated, they feel like they have nobody that they can talk to. And normally when you see this happening with one child in the family, it's not just one, but it's other children that this is going on in the same household or in similar families. And so this child grew up and um, made, like I said, chose the wrong relationships and things, ended up in a lot of domestic violence. And there's a saying that wounded spirits attract wounded spirits. When you're wounded and you're hurt, that's what you draw to you. That's what you attract to you. But if you're whole and you're healed, and then you recognize the abuse, you recognize these things as they're gonna come around and people that's gonna try to abuse you. And so after this young person was 40 years old, it's like, um, you know, Moses wandered around the wilderness for 40 years and didn't know where he was going, but finally he did. And so this person, after the age of 40, finally realized that, you know, they had to have some help in this area. And the person I'm talking about is myself. And so all that abuse and everything I went through in my life, I, I'm so thankful that I'm healed from all of that. And so from that, I was able to start working with women and children that are battered and abused. And so uh, from that experience, I was able to work with women and tell them, that our children, it's okay, you know, to talk about these issues, the things that's happening to you in your life. And, and so it's, um, it, give me, it made me a lot stronger, a person that I am today. But one of the things is the education and how we got involved in people. When, when I got involved with People to People, um, we started a project, and I do have an organization called Shaking Off Shackles. And so through Shaking Off Shackles, what we, it's a nonprofit. We work with the neighborhoods and communities, and um, one of our biggest projects that we have is with, with a Walter and Andrew Young YMCA here in Atlanta. And so we make awareness of what's going on with the children in the neighborhoods and the communities. And uh, so many of these children are coming <coughs> From, they don't even know who their moms and dads are. And so many of them are coming from the juvenile justice system. The courts are sending them over to the Andrew and Young y, uh, YMCA. But from the Maya Angelo Teen Center, through Shaking Off Shackles and People to People, we, every year, we for the past two years, we've sponsored the YMCA. We raise awareness about the abuse in the neighborhoods and communities. We work with them on the educational policies and um, we're very, very strong into education because we know that is one of the key things that we need to be educating the children, but not just the children. We reach into the families to educate them as well. So <coughs> with the People to People, um, we have been able to sponsor children. And so when I say sponsor, it costs $480 a year for a child to go to the after school program at the Maya Angelo Teen Center. And so what that does, 
This gives that child a hot meal because so many of them don't have any hot meals to eat. It gives them a place that they can take a shower. They, um, they're edu they're a lot of them are tutored for their GED. And um, so we were able to sponsor the children and they have the right people there working with them, you know, even in arts and entertainment. And so when you have a child, a 12 year old girl walks up to me and she said, Miss Linda, I'm thinking about going into prostitution. I said, honey, why would you want to go into prostitution? And she said, because I don't have the money for deodorant. I don't have any money for to buy toothpaste and things like this. And, and, and y'all, this just shouldn't be. And so I started working with her and we were able to give her packets, you know, to supply things like toothpaste, shampoo, deodorant, not just for the girls, but the young boys too. Things that we take for granted, they don't even have, they, there's no way that they can get these things for themselves because some of them, like I said, they don't even know who their parents are. They're living with their grandmothers or their aunties and so they get kicked out on the streets because they can't afford to feed them anymore and take care of them. So if we're not there to meet them, I can assure you the pimps and the gangs are there ready for them. And so this is an area that we're very strong in working with our, with our youth. But, um, but let me say this about the after school program that they have. And I'm so excited about this because through this program, through this mentoring program and things that we help sponsor to keep these children off of the streets and education and out of the crimes and the gangs, they've had over 35 children to graduate from that after school program and are going to college. That is amazing. And I credit Ambassador Andrew Young for that as well because Ambassador Young is the one is named after he and his brother. And he meets with these children. He, you know, he comes and he prays over these children before they take off and go back to college, you know. I mean, but they're mentoring, they're pouring so much into them. So through our People to People chapter, we have been able to help raise awareness. We have been able to help raise money for the children to be able to stay in these after school programs. And on, on the international level, we have worked in Haiti and through our Haitian project, there was a little girl by the name of Angelique in 2009. We sponsored the Angelique Project through People to People. And Angelique was a little girl, and I was traveling in Haiti with a team of doctors from Emory. Angelique was a little girl that was sexually molested. Her body was exchanged for safe drinking water. So her mother took her to the clinic, and when the doctors examined her, they realized that she had all these diseases, and the mother thought she was cursed, which she was not cursed. But through that process, what we did was we sponsored the Angelique Project. We sponsored an orphanage, and um, we were able to um, provide uh, booklets for the children. Um, it was called The Friendly Enemy, which I endorsed, and so I've got a copy here. And The Friendly Enemy comes in the workbook. It's adolescent for children and for adults, but it's teaching the children all about what to watch out for is when somebody comes to be your friend only that turns out to be your enemy. So through that process, we, they, we made awareness of safe drinking water as well. So we brought people in with us to the orphanage and to the to country of Haiti. But let me go back, the friendly enemy, every child that we sponsor for Christmas at the orphanage there, they received a baby doll and soccer ball. They received a copy of the Friendly Enemy that was translated into Haitian with coloring books. So, and then social workers got copy of the adult workbooks that they were able to work with the children, educating them about the Friendly Enemy. So those are some areas that we have made, in, lots of them. But internationally, we are so connected through people to people and are shaking off shackles. We're in, we just got a call to be involved in Moldova on organ trafficking of children there. And um, we have been, we're very involved with Israel. We're in, um, we've been asked to come to do satellite teaching in Pakistan. And I was just amazed that that just came about as well. So there's a lot of areas that we have been um, involved in, but I want to say this about people to people on the international level, how we can work because Atlanta is an international city. 
And if we've got people-to-people -people chapters around the world, we can educate our people in the people-to-people -people chapters around the world and that own human trafficking and the different parts of education and different ways that they can be connected in with Dennis, with Bryan College and some of the other people that around this world that can help. But we can certainly make a huge impact through people-to-people -people international and that is boots on the ground, and I know that that would make a huge impact for human trafficking. And I know you've done quite a bit of work with the State Department, with a lot of countries. You mentioned that some you didn't, Albania, Turkey, I mean, all through um, the former Soviet Union, Eastern Bloc, et cetera, um, even in some of the Middle East. Um, what are and you've been, I think, on the People of People International Board. You talked a little bit about what they can do internationally. Um, and obviously, uh, also, I think, you've been very involved in the State Department. What, what do you, as you looked at the um, educational journey and process you went with, and through with Ambassador Young and, and engaging at the local level, and you've talked about um, educating people uh, internationally, um, you mentioned projects in Moldova, et, et cetera. How do you think you, you can engage with the board and the membership of People to People International uh, so that what you have done successfully in Atlanta and are doing internationally can be replicated through other memberships and other communities around the world? How, how do you think you guys can instantiate uh, that example uh, throughout the network? Are there any further thoughts that you have about that? One of the things that I believe that um, would be very successful and um, the things that, that I'm very involved in is with the, um, the Council of General's Office, you know, working mm -hmm. with them because they're um, each, you know, in Atlanta, you know, like I said, is the international hub. And so when you've got the Council General's working with you in these different um, arenas, because they're all facing this in their own country and they have to go back and deal with this. And so it's an area that, you know, they are willing to be on board. Mm -hmm. You know, they're looking for people to engage, and especially here because that's one of their, um, when they come to Atlanta, you know, and that's one of their outreaches to be in the community, to be involved in everything that's going on. So that is one of the areas I know that we can bring in different organizations, you know, together to be a part of all of this because like I said, you know, this is a big elephant and we don't have all the pieces of the pie, but collectively we can come together and we can do this. But, you know, in the education part of it, you know, and through our, through our Atlanta chapter is that we can help work with the different organizations, you know, um, uh, boots on the ground to help them to help them get connected into the right levels that they need to be in connected into. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Linda. Mary Frances Bowley, uh, who's with Wellspring Living. Can you talk about Wellspring, how it's combating this issue, how you got involved, some of the programs that you're engaged in, how you're addressing the issue? Absolutely. Um, about 14 years ago, um, I became aware of just the disparity between young women um, who were without hope and those who had hope, and how could we bridge that gap? And so a group of women that just have a caring heart banded together and provided a place, a safe place, for young women to just retreat and get their life together. And so as we did that, the very first young woman that walked through our doors was a trafficking survivor. But in 2001, we weren't even really talking about that. So didn't even have words to go around it, but um, she ran away from home when she was 16 uh, with her boyfriend, who was 29, to Kansas City, and then she escaped because of all the things that were happening to her, and uh, got on a Greyhound bus, came back to Atlanta, and was actually trafficked among some townhomes off the Northbridge Parkway. So it's just like right in the middle of the suburbs, and this is just a, a girl that could have been my daughter. And so it blew my mind and uh, fueled our passion that we wanted to understand how it could happen. And so as we continue to serve young women, we all recognize that childhood sexual abuse, as many have already shared, was that core issue. And so developed programming around it, created a structure. And by 2007, we were seeing great success with young women rebuilding their lives. And Mayor Franklin actually came to me 
at a breakfast in downtown Atlanta and said, I know what you're doing for women and I, we need your help with girls who are being bought and sold on the streets. And at that time I thought, well, that's probably sensationalism. It couldn't be that bad. But the more I looked into it, the more I realized it was very bad, worse than I could have imagined. And so we partnered with a child care agency and opened a home for young girls ages 12 to 17. And uh, providing for them, if you think about a, a middle school, high school girl, they've got to have an education. So we have personalized education. We are partnered with um, Provost Academy, which is an online charter school. And we provide this teacher in the room as, as well as a pair pro, helping these girls get on grade level. And you may think, well, they come in two years behind. How, that's going to be impossible. But these girls are smart. They're resilient. And you give them the right way of them being able to learn in an environment where they can do it at their own pace. They feel safe. They catch up um, within eight to 10 months. They're on grade level. It's, it's remarkable. Um, we also work with trauma-informed care, both with our women and our girls. And so helping them to recover from what's happened to them recognizing that uh, our practices have to be strength-based, they have to be building relationships and trust because the very people that they should have been able to trust were not trustworthy. Then we really believe that it's important that the girls develop a supportive community, and so we have a lot of volunteers that work alongside us and provide their life skill classes, and they come in and teach for about six weeks at a time a specific uh, subject that they are experts on, I, and um, in that, uh, our girls are able to actually get elective credits. Our young women are just getting great, great support skills for them to be able to rebuild their lives. And um, most recently, um, with our young women, we have uh, begun a new program called Empowered Living Academy. And working out of the Carver YMCA, we're providing young women the opportunity for them to heal from what's happened to them. Um, really understand what, who are safe and who aren't safe. Uh, Carver provides for them fitness classes. We provide lunch, childcare, and barter classes, and we provide technical training. We have a Microsoft certified teacher on staff that helps them learn um, how to be uh, worth that computer. And then we are partnered with Ronstadt US, which is the second largest staffing agency in the world. And they, along with Coke, provide training, professional training, that help them to be able to go into um, employment. And not only do they provide the training, they also provide 160 hours of paid apprenticeship at like $12 an hour, which is pretty great. And so we began that as a pilot in the spring of last year, offered it as a community-based program beginning this fall. And the beauty of that is that it's not just for young women we serve uh, through Wellspring, but it's also for any woman ages 18 to 32. So I just encourage you, if you know a young woman that either is at risk or has been trafficked, please refer them to us. It's a 10 week intensive. They go through this Monday through Friday like they're in a technical school. And at the end of that time, they get to go into that paid apprenticeship. And what we've seen that every one of them get jobs. It's been amazing. And one of the key elements for us to know that it's working is we began small in the fall with 11 girls. December, we still had 11 girls. January, we started our next session with 18 girls. March, we ended with 17 girls. One was pregnant, had a baby. We began with 20 girls in April, and here we are coming up on finishing up a session. So it's, it's great, and we're serving young women that are being referred to us from 49 different agencies around Metro Atlanta. Um, from government agencies to nonprofits such as Salvation Army, Chris Kids, Covenant House, anybody you've heard that serves young women, they've been offered this opportunity. It doesn't cost them anything, but it's a win for both organizations because we are putting our name low and putting Empowered Living Academy out at the school so everybody feels safe. This is for the girl. And this model is completely duplicatable because we don't have the facility cost. The YMCA has been so generous to us that we're duplicating it at Peachtree Corners this fall and meeting with some people um, next week to see how we can make this a national model. So for 14 years, we've just kind of grown in a lot of different ways, learning a lot all along the way, but seeing amazing young women and girls rebuild their lives and move forward. And so that's what we've been involved in. Could, could you quickly provide some advice for those in the room who'd like to do this in their local community but don't have a Wellspring Living or another organization? Obviously, you uh, 
can we give some advice in, as far as a social entrepreneur, et cetera, and things that will help for you in launching this effort? Sure. Um, so our organization has what one of our branches is an institute, and so any city, any area that wants to uh, do something similar, we provide training and coaching, and actually, um, whether it's um, you want mentoring, which is a more intense piece, or you're working already in this area, but you want to like deepen your understanding of what are the practices that really work in this population, because it's not the same as like drugs and stuff like that. Uh, we provide four times a year what we call direct care training mm -hmm. and it's a four day nine to five opportunity to get trained by professionals in strength-based and trauma-informed care and understanding mindset training all the things that you need to be able to provide the best care for um, young women and girls and then um, monthly we have what's called networking calls and um, anybody can come out it's a google hangout and we take a theme um, that deals with what do you need as best practices and we bring in an expert to, to um, on the call and we worked with about 160 different um, cities and organizations um, in the last year and um, all this information is on our website you're more than welcome to um, you know talk to me later about it but that's the way we try to help we don't feel like we need to go into every city and develop a wellspring living but we can use what we've learned and help them understand how they can raise up people. That's the way we like to approach thank you. it. All right, and I'm gonna quickly ask, uh, thank you, uh, Harry Gossett, uh, if you guys would pass the, he's the director of security at the um, Intercontinental Hotel. I know there's, an, there's a national and there's an international association with hotels, a, a agreement they've signed, et cetera. Can you talk a little bit about security issues that hotels are facing to try to recognize perpetrators and victims to try to put a stop to it, to try to create an educational awareness, or what security issues you face in this area? Thank you, Ross. <coughs> Thank Excuse you. Me. Thank you, Ross. Um, I guess I could start by saying that um, I came here from Houston, ironically enough, and uh, I thought I was leaving a large problem behind, uh, only to find out that uh, when I got here, uh, it was significantly more of a problem. And I realized um, day to day we obviously have a lot of challenges running a hotel and dealing with the issues that people bring with them uh, when they check into a hotel. Uh, but the, the human trafficking aspect of it is, is uh, completely off the charts. Uh, it's extremely complex. Uh, you have obviously a demand side uh, as well as the supply side of it. Um, unfortunately, uh, there's not a whole lot I don't, I don't want to say it's not a whole lot that's being done, but we're having to take baby steps, so to speak, uh, in terms of dealing with this issue uh, in a substantive way. Uh, the thing that I, uh, I can tell you about from my own experience is that um, previously, um, I guess it was around 2003, I was working uh, for a hotel uh, on Cortland Street, and right across the street from us, we had a, uh, a gentleman's club, shall we say. And that particular club uh, was the source, a magnet for problems in terms of uh, trafficking, uh, in terms of loud, loud people who were circulating into the hotel, creating issues for the guests, uh, fights, um, just an, an array of things that uh, probably kept the chief here uh, very busy. But uh, the thing that, uh, that I can tell you that we did, uh, or, in, or in fact my, my uh, general manager did, he was the, uh, the one responsible, uh, who really motivated me because he was uh, steadfast in his resolve to uh, close this gentleman's club. Um, and he went through a tremendous amount of work and effort uh, by partnering with the city, um, talking to the code enforcement people, and uh, actually was able to get the liquor license of the gentleman's club pulled. Uh, he partnered with uh, Chief Pennington, who was the police chief in, in Atlanta at the time, as well as Mayor Franklin. And uh, through his efforts and uh, concerted efforts uh, from the hotel community, uh, we were able to close this particular gentleman's club 
and eliminated a significant problem in terms of trafficking. Uh, the same thing, kind of on a lesser scale, you know, we're dealing with it in Buckhead uh, because we have, of course, a lot of folks who travel here who have a, a great deal of means and um, they don't always conduct themselves in, shall we say, a very appropriate manner. Um, so typically what happens is, is I will get a call uh, from a gentleman who may have picked up some woman on the street uh, and it's usually sometime around about 5 a.m., 6 a.m. in the morning, I'll get the call and um, he will most likely complain that someone broke into his room and stole his iPad, someone stole his Rolex watch, uh, someone stole uh, his, uh, his cash and, you know, we go through this interview process with them and we ask them, one of the first things I ask them is, did you let anybody into your room, sir? Oh, no, no, no. no nobody came into me. And unfortunately, what they don't understand is that we take these things very seriously. And so when we investigate them, we go through our, our closed circuit television system, our video system. We can, we can look at them and trace them from the time that they come from, uh, that they arrive at the front drive, as they walk through the lobby with this person, as they get on the elevator, uh, the uh, guest elevators, and ride up uh, to the floor. So, you know, we've got documented evidence of them with this person throughout the entire night. And then, you know, we have to, of course, do the big reveal, as they say. Uh, we have to sit them down and explain to them that, listen, this is not a joke. When you make an, an allegation of this sort, you need to be sure that this is absolutely true. Um, and so, you know, we'll spread out photos of them with this person and explain to them that if you're not going to accept responsibility, we can't help you, okay? Um, you have to take responsibility for your actions. We are not gonna take responsibility for you. So, you know, those are the kinds of things that we deal with, not I wanna say on a daily basis, but it happens more often than you would think. And of course, you know, I have to spend my time investigating these things and then trying to defend the hotel against people who, shall we say, make poor choices. Thank you, thank you. I wanna thank each of our panelists um, and I, I hope you'll, you'll approach them separately to ask individual questions of each of them. I apologize that we're so tight on time, excuse me. Um, and we're going to have a, I think now a case study. Yeah, we're going to do a, a quick case study. We're going to pass these out um, at each table. Um, I think a couple of minutes to read and discuss amongst you on the table before we learn the panel is what could someone have done to intervene in this child's life? So is it a, a real life example of a person's story? And what you guys discuss? At the table?